Well, this morning, as we turn uh, to God's Word together, we've come to our fifth message in our current series uh, together, uh, Walking Through the Sermon on the Mount. We're uh, taking a prolonged look at Jesus' teaching found in just three chapters, Matthew chapters 5 to 7, and we've seen over and over again, and we'll continue to see again and again, that Jesus' teaching is deeply and personally challenging. Uh, Throughout these chapters, our Lord radically challenges us with teaching that is both hard-hitting and deeply countercultural. He continually calls us to see things differently from how we normally and naturally do by default. Uh, We're called to think differently, which leads to living differently. And certainly, uh, much of what Jesus says in these chapters, and today, friends, is no exception, is more than a bit jarring at first. Uh, The Sermon on the Mount has this uh, characteristic of kind of almost feeling like we've been, someone has grabbed us and shaken us a little bit. It's it's jarring. Jesus' words uh, can be jarring to us, especially when we first hear them. And this morning, we'll see that both Jesus' command, his teaching on the command specifically, you shall not commit adultery, and then his teaching addressing the difficult topic of divorce, that both of these things are deeply challenging. And we'll find ourselves facing a shocking call to take sin seriously and to deal with sin in our lives drastically. And the result of all of that ought to bring us to the foot of the cross, to gazing on the cross, to gazing on the cross where Christ's body was broken and His blood was shed so that we can be saved, so that we can be forgiven. And with that in mind, I'd like to read the passage now. I'd encourage you to follow along. It'll also be on the screens. It's in your bulletin as well. Matthew chapter 5 and verses 27 to 32. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that, any, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. It is also said, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, That everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Well, certainly, Jesus says some things that are jarring, to say the very least. I, I, I saw the look on some of our faces and go, that's jarring. That's a little rattling. These are the words of our Savior. This is the word of the Lord. I mean, did you catch just how shocking this is? Uh, The beginning of verse 29, Jesus says this, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. I mean, like, that is incredibly shocking. Uh, let's, Let's walk through this a little bit. And we're going to see Jesus' teaching goes beyond mere external observance to the heart of the command, you shall not commit adultery. And here Jesus continues the pattern of taking up a familiar command from the law, from the Old Testament law specifically, in showing that a merely external observance of that command is woefully inadequate. Uh, Last week we considered Jesus' relationship with the Old Testament law, And just by way of review, he said this in verse 17, if you roll your eyes back up the page, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. He says, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then a little farther down in verse 20, also of Matthew chapter 5, 
Jesus is clear that merely checking the boxes of an external religious checklist, uh, so focusing on our external performance, doesn't lead to heaven. Checking the boxes, it's sometimes been described as the deadly do's and don'ts, and checking off the box and going, I do this, I do this, I do this, done. I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, done. I must be fine. Jesus says, oh no. Verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Trusting in our performance of a checklist is deadly, and the scribes and Pharisees were known for just this error. Uh, They were experts at externally keeping the rules. They were really good at it. In fact, they were known for their rules about following the rules. They they made additional rules, uh, uh, rules about following the rules. Yet the problem, of course, is that their hearts were not at all right with God. And in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus rebuked them with some of the strongest words found anywhere in the Bible, Matthew chapter 23, he calls them whitewashed tombs. Because they looked good on the outside, their external performance looked great on the outside, but inside it was rotten. It's possible to look good on the outside, but be rotten on the inside, to the core. And Jesus picks up Different, and, and from this rebuke and this teaching about his relationship with the Old Testament law, he picks up different topics and commands of the Old Testament law. And as Jesus picks up and teaches on these commands, he demonstrates that thought, intent, and motive matter to God. The condition of our heart, what's on the inside, it matters. Jesus turns our thinking inside out and upside down, showing us that it's not about external observance, but about the internal attitudes of the heart. And as Jesus moves from topic to topic, he begins by saying, you have heard that it was said. And then he immediately follows with a surprising and intensifying statement that begins with the words, but I say to you. And what follows that, but I say to you, always moves beyond external performance, beyond checking the boxes into the heart of the issue, looking on the inside. And in all of this, Jesus is teaching about commands that many of us would be tempted to take some confidence in based on our external performance. We'd be tempted to put our external performance of the commands that Jesus is teaching on uh, at the top of a religious checklist that we'd be generating for ourselves, saying, check, check. I kept that, I kept that one, I kept that one too. And Jesus is saying to all of us in his teaching, hey, not so fast. Not so fast. His teaching destroys, I know that's a strong word, but it's true, destroys any ill-founded confidence we would have in checking the boxes about these commands and rather demonstrates that every one of us is a serious lawbreaker before God. I told you the Sermon on the Mount is challenging. And we're going to see that this rightfully drives us to the gospel. Look at verse 27 if you're following along in your Bible. Jesus begins this pattern with the words, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And so the topic has shifted from the command previously, just a few verses back, you shall not murder, to now you shall not commit adultery. That's from the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20 and verse 14. The shift is from the sixth, to the seventh commandment, if you're counting. And I'd encourage all of us uh, to take some time and read Exodus 20 and review the Ten Commandments. And another well-known Old Testament passage, 
uh, Proverbs 6.32. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. We ought to let that one just pause and sit there for a minute. Destroys himself. Jesus' original audience and many of us were and are familiar with these passages with the, you have heard that it was said. But that's only the beginning. Next comes the, but I say to you. And verse 28 says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I'll I'll be modest how we talk about this, but... uh, We might be tempted to take pride in self-righteousness and put on our checklist and say, I've never done that. I've never committed adultery. And it might be easy to externally insist, uh, boldly stating, along with I've never committed adultery, that come on, none of us are perfect, but I've never murdered anyone either. The twisted logic is designed, that twisted logic, which is natural, it's the way we default, is designed to help us think, or to to trick us into thinking, to convince ourselves, to make us comfortable with ourselves, that we're, we might make mistakes, but we're all pretty good, right? Wrong. I mean, that's the default. That's where we go. Well, we're all pretty good. I'm not that bad. And Jesus goes, no, not at all. Our self-confident verbal, uh, bubbles are burst and burst severely. Jesus turns our thinking inside out and upside down and dramatically raises the standards, especially keeping the commandment to avoid adultery, uh, but break, uh, you know, externally keeping the commandment to avoid adultery, but breaking it in our minds is breaking the commandment to avoid adultery, period. Jesus is just that clear. Jesus says that cherishing the lust that leads to the act is committing adultery in our heart. And similarly, last week, he linked anger with murder. Now adultery is linked with lustful thoughts and intentions. None of us should be feeling self-confident. We should all be feeling guilty. Right? Now, I realize it's an uncomfortable subject, and we'd all probably be more careful, comfortable avoiding it, but we need to consider what Jesus says is tremendously counter-cultural. Our culture says you can... Look, but you can't touch. Jesus says, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Our culture says, let your mind wander, just don't act on those thoughts. Jesus says, absolutely not. According to Jesus, our inner thought life matters deeply. It's not only about external observance. Yes, that's important. But it's about the inner condition of the heart. And what comes out is a function of what's on the inside. So when we say uh, in any area, not just this area, it doesn't matter what's on the inside. Oh, yeah, it does. Because what we think about is what we'll do. Our thoughts lead our actions. And practically and candidly, this means consuming many forms of normal media and entertainment result in the sin of adultery. It certainly includes what is known in our society as pornography, but a whole lot more than that, Thoughtless consumption of all sorts of TV, movies, and literature ought to be reconsidered in light of Jesus' words. Again, I'm going to be modest about that, but let me just put it that way. All sorts of entertainment and media needs to be reconsidered in light of Jesus' words. I'm convinced that every one of us needs to practice the words of the first part of Psalm 101 and verse 3. Make the commitment. I will set... I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. That's great. There's actually an older translation. I will set before my eyes no vile thing. That ought to be something that every one of us is just, you know, Lord, help me to do that. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. We desperately need to guard what we allow in through our eyes. We're not uh, we're talking about a common struggle, both men and women, and it's not innocent, most of us in our, as, as most of us in our culture would want us to believe. We need to guard our minds. The sobering truth is that our thought life, again, it leads our actions. What we fill our minds with will lead to the actions we take. We need to stand guard over our thoughts, a theme that runs throughout the Bible. Job, his character in the Bible is, is held up. And in, in, in 
In Job 31.1, he says, I made a covenant with my eyes. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. A covenant with his eyes. Or Philippians 4.8, uh, again, dealing with our thoughts. Finally, brothers, brothers and sisters would be such an appropriate uh, application. Finally, brothers, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. You getting the idea? If there is any excellence... If there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. You know, I, I learned many years ago that memorizing that was a real help because sometimes when a thought, when we're tempted to think about something, we need to go through that checklist. Whatever is, now I learned it in a little different translation, but we need to go through the checklist. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. Does this, is this fit in those categories? And if not, should I be thinking about this? No, it fails the test. And reflecting on God's word has a great way of driving out, doing battle with temptation, with bad thoughts, all manner of, uh, of, uh, that they may be, uh, regarding whether they be anger or, or lust or whatever the case could be. We must guard our thoughts and resist the temptation uh, for our eyes to wonder. We must do battle with temptation through the word of God, wielding the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That said, Jesus doesn't slow down with regard to the shocking words, does he? Verses 29 and 30, if your right eye causes you to sin, or the New International Version translates it stumble, if your right eye causes you to sin or stumble, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. These words confront us with the absolute seriousness of sin. This is shocking. We're, after all, talking about gouging out eyes and cutting off hands. Now, this isn't advocating or teaching self-mutilation. This is a, a pattern of literature known as hyperbole, kind of like saying uh, as many as the sand on the seashore. Uh, but this is intended to jar and shock us. This should rattle us. This should make us feel like, whoa, what just hit me? This calls us to take sin extremely seriously and to deal with it drastically. We need to take Jesus' words to heart. Our culture downplays and minimizes sin. We say, come on, no one's perfect. Or I try my best, but we all make some mistakes. And these statements, yes, they're popular, but they seriously miss the mark because they misrepresent the horror of sin. And in misrepresenting the horror of sin, they excuse a lackadaisical, non-serious response to sin. When sin isn't that serious, we respond to it in a kind of a casual way. When we see the horror of sin, then we see that we need to deal with it drastically. Sin is against God. It's rebellion against our Creator. That's what sin is. We must take sin extremely seriously and deal with it drastically, and we need to heed Jesus' words and apply them. And the subject of hell is brought up here actually three times in the span of just a few verses. Sin, and make no mistake about it, sin sends people to hell. Hell is mentioned in verse 22, verse 29, and verse 30. I remember someone saying, you know, maybe uh, many years ago when I was back in Michigan, I was having lunch with some people, and they were talking about, um, well, how do you help people understand the, horror, the, you know, the problem of sin? And one guy goes, well, we just talk about we could all do a little better. I said, well, I don't disagree with that statement, but that's not, that's not getting at the, that's not even scratching the surface of the horror of sin. And I said, and you know, he, he was a Christian. I said, well, sin sends people to hell. And, you know, he just looked at me like, uh, uh, you know, like I just, I said, do you read what Jesus says? It's serious. It should drive us to the foot of the cross. We're the only place where forgiveness is found. But sin is cosmic treason. That's a good way to describe it. I think our society struggles with sin. We say we all make mistakes, which we do. I don't disagree with that. I've made plenty. But sin is, should, is, should not be described as a mistake. Sin is cosmic treason against our Creator. And when we see it for what it is, then we see that we need to deal drastically with it. 
And if we come to a place where we're in a situation where any particular situation that we regularly put ourselves in leads us into sin, leads us into struggling with temptation, we see that dealing drastically with it would be trying to remove ourselves in the future from a situation that we would be putting ourselves in that would cause us to fall into sin, right? If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your uh, hand causes you to sin, uh, cut it off. Taking it seriously, removing ourselves from those uh, situations, steering clear from situations that would get us into trouble with temptation. The call here is to deal drastically and radically with sin. I won't apologize for that being jarring. I needed it too. Jesus' words are very jarring. They're true. 100%. This is God's word. And after addressing the topic of adultery, Jesus turns to the difficult topic of divorce. Now, I need to stay up front that this is a challenging topic. And with that in mind, I'm not going to be able to say everything that the Bible teaches about marriage and divorce in a few moments. And I also want to compassionately acknowledge that divorce has probably touched the life of everyone in this room in one way or another. And for many, it is a deeply, deeply painful topic. That said, God's word addresses this subject, and we need to address it too even though it is difficult and uncomfortable. And with that in mind, following the same pattern, Jesus picks up the Old Testament law and raises the standards dramatically. In verse 31, he says, it was also said, and then right away in verse 32, the pattern continues, but I say to you. In Jesus' words, look back to the law governing divorce, specifically Deuteronomy 24. I just want to read the first verse, Deuteronomy 24. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her and writes her a certificate of divorce. Did you hear me reading about that? Uh, When I read the passage, writes her a certificate of, of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house and she departs from the house. So you see this tragedy and there's this teaching in the in Deuteronomy 24 about a certificate of divorce. Now let's consider carefully what Jesus says about divorce, realizing that Jesus calls us to living that is deeply countercultural. Our culture uh, s- currently styles divorce, if you read some of the more popular publications, as conscious uncoupling. I don't know if you've heard that word, but I, I've read it a couple of different places, and I, it's like, uh, that's not what divorce is, but that's what people are calling it. And we have, for decades, what has been styled and I do mean that word styled because uh, it's, it just, it's, it's not right, but styled as no-fault divorce. We say we fell in love and fell out of love, but that's not what Jesus says in verse 32. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, I would add that the application very much goes both ways, uh, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Divorce is flagrantly contrary to God's plan for marriage. Flagrantly. God's plan for marriage was laid out back with our first parents, grandparents way back, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. A man and a woman for a lifetime within the God-ordained covenant of marriage. That's God's plan. Think back to Adam and Eve. Genesis 2.24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now I need to just be honest that our culture has wandered very far from God's good design for marriage. And I'm going to say some things that might be a little jarring, but they're true. We need to think about this. We not only have no-fault divorce, that was arguably the start of a lot of this, the seed that caused a lot of other things, but biblically speaking, there is no such thing as same-sex marriage. Our society might call it that, but it's a fiction. It's not marriage, according to the Lord. It needs to be stated just that clearly. And I also need to state very clearly that living together outside of the covenant of marriage is absolutely contrary to God's plan and is sinful as well. 
You say, how do we respond to that? Because those things are the case around us. Friends, we need to have compassion for the confused and deceived. We need to be people of compassion. We need to have compassion for the, confu- for the confused and deceived, but we must never celebrate the sin. I'm going to say that again because I think we need, to think of, we need to think well about this, and I don't think that we're always doing a good job. I mean, I, I'm not speaking specifically to us, but I think Christians have struggled with how to think about this. We need to have compassion for the confused and deceived. But we must never, ever celebrate sin. Again, our culture has wandered very far from God's good design for marriage, laid out with Adam and Eve. And Jesus says a whole lot more in Matthew 19, verses 3 to 9. Just listen to these words. They'll be on the slides behind me as well. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Sound like Genesis 2? It certainly is. It's a quote of it. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. They said to them, said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of, a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but, it was, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. So Jesus' teaching on divorce is certainly a big subject about which there is lots of discussion among people who love God's word. And I'm not going to be able to answer every question that we might have ever faced, that we'll ever face with this regard, in, in this regard uh, this morning. But Jesus teaches that the vo- divorce is permissible but not required in cases of sexual immorality. And from what I've read, and I understand there are a lot of discussions here, uh, massive discussions among people who love God's Word, but from what I have read and from the study that I have done, it seems reasonably clear that Jewish tradition at the time tended to require divorce for adultery, where Jesus, notice, does not require it, uh, but he permits it in the cases of sexual immorality. And the English Standard Version translates the word, that, the word that we get sexual immorality from. It's translated differently in different translations. It's the Greek word porneia. It means sexual immorality, and you can kind of get where it goes. It, it, the word is porneia. It's a term that speaks generally of sexual sin. So Jesus is saying in such cases, divorce is permissible, though never ideal. Certainly never ideal. Divorce is never good, but at times it's the least negative option in cases of porneia sexual immorality jesus permits it but certainly does not but even then he's changing the challenging the the notion that it was required and saying it's permissible but not not he's certainly not requiring it now all this is hard this is shocking stuff but upon Considering the command, you shall not murder, last week, and now the command, you shall not commit adultery this week, is anybody feeling good? Going, My boxes are checked. I'm, I'm all set. None of us should be feeling confident about a performance, period. That is really the point. And all of this needs to drive us to the foot of the cross where forgiveness and mercy are found. No one will ever stand before God on the basis of their performance of a religious checklist. So ask yourself this morning, where's my confidence? Is it in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross? Or is it in my checking different boxes saying, did that, did that, did that, did that? That's a dead end. The only way to stand before God is in Christ's imputed imputed righteousness. And considering the internal condition of our hearts, friends, the internal condition of our heart before the Lord showing that it's not about external observance, it's not about the external checklist, but it's about what's on the inside, confronts us yet again with our utter spiritual poverty. Blessed are the poor 
in spirit. Oh, how we need the Savior. We are sinners, and as sinners, we deserve God's punishment on sin. His wrath poured out justly upon us in hell. Yet on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ died as our substitute and as the substitute, perfect substitution, paying the penalty that all of us deserve, paying the penalty for all who will ever trust in Him for salvation. Jesus got what He did not deserve so that we do not have to face what we justly do. Jesus faced the wrath of God, which he alone did not deserve, perfect. We do not have to face the wrath of God, because he took as our substitute what he alone did not deserve, so that we do not have to face what we do. He suffered and died as our substitute. His sacrifice satisfied God's just wrath. So if you haven't yet come to the place of acknowledging that you are a sinner and that you're powerless to save yourself and acknowledging that there is no way that you can do enough good, that your righteousness, that your performance of the checklist will not earn you anything before God, I'd encourage you to acknowledge your sin, acknowledge its cosmic treason, acknowledge your rebellion against your Creator and say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I'm powerless to save myself. I'm a sinner and I deserve your judgment. I'm a sinner and I deserve hell. But I'm turning my eyes and placing my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, in Him alone, God Himself, the second person of the Trinity, who came to this sin-sick fallen world, lived the perfect life that I could never live, and took the death that I deserve so that I don't have to face it. And Lord, I am placing my belief, my faith, my trust in You alone to save me. And the moment that we surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. The moment we turn from our sins and place our belief, our faith, our trust, those words are related in the original, in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone to save us on the basis of what He did on Calvary's cross, we cross from death to life, from unforgiven to forgiven, from God's enemy to His friend, from eternal death to eternal life, from uh, headed to hell, an object of God's wrath, justly deserving His wrath and under His wrath, Uh, to a citizen of heaven. It's the wonder of grace. So I would encourage you, if you have not personally made that commitment, do that this morning. And if you're feeling convicted as we prepare to turn to the Lord's table, friends, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, every one of us should feel convicted. The Christian life is one of continually repenting of sin and turning and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ, continually confessing our sins, saying, Lord, I'm not who I was by your grace, but I'm not who I should be. Continue, Lord, to change me from the inside out. So as we come to the Lord's table, it is good for us to pause and reflect, to consider our rebellion against God, to consider the horror of our sin, and then to turn our gaze with wonder on the grace of God, revealed most clearly and fully, at the cross, not facing what we deserve for our sin. Our culture tends to view sin as no big deal, as an illness to be treated. We need to see it rightly as an evil against our Creator to be repented of. Reflecting on Jesus' words calls us to consider the horror of our sin. How serious is our sin? It cost our Savior His life. We need to deal drastically with it. So let's Turn together to the Lord's table and hear these words from 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. On the night when He was betrayed, just before He went to the cross, Jesus took bread and broke it and said, This is My body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. Where was Christ's body broken? On the cross. 
And then he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Where was Christ's blood shed? As the crown of thorns was pressed into his head. As he was whipped and beaten. As the nails were pounded into his hands and his feet. And as the spear pierced his side. His blood was shed for us. Christ died for our sins. And as his followers were to continually celebrate this meal, remembering Christ's body broken and his blood shed, remembering the bedrock foundation of our faith is Christ's sacrificial and substitutionary death on the cross for our sins. The word propitiation, it means a sacrifice turning aside the wrath of God. And as we eat and drink together, we look back to the cross and forward in expectation to his promised and glorious return. And looking back to the cross and forward in expectation to his return motivates Christian living today. I would say it even stronger. It motivates grounded perspective today. You want to know how to be a person of hope. You want to know how not to get pulled uh, hither and yon by every crazy news story and, and how to be grounded Look back to the cross and forward to his return. It puts everything in perspective. It motivates grounded Christian living today. We look back to the basis of our forgiveness, the basis of our salvation, and forward in blessed hope. This world will not be broken forever. The King of kings and Lord of lords is coming back, riding on a white horse. And sin and the very effects of sin will be dealt with completely and finally. So anyone who is a follower of Jesus is welcome to participate. You don't have to be a regular here at our church, but we do ask that you be honest with yourself and with God, and that the Lord's Supper is only for those who have come to the place of placing their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone to save you. If you're not ready to personally proclaim Christ's death and all its benefits personally, then please just quietly refrain. Or perhaps in these moments you're saying, I now understand the gospel, and in the quietness of your heart in these moments you could surrender your life to the lord jesus christ and then celebrate with joy saying all my hope is in jesus i've placed my faith and trust in him alone to save me on the basis of his substitution on calvary's cross his death in resurrection you could make that commitment right now don't wait and we're also told to examine ourselves and oh how the sermon on the mount helps with that doesn't it so in a few moments, I'm going to pray. And then there's going to be some background music and just some time for some silent reflection. Pray, do the business with God you need to do, and then we're going to eat and drink together with joy because of the grace of God. But take this time to examine yourself. And if you, God shows you, if the Holy Spirit lays sin on your heart, ask for his forgiveness knowing that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray together, and then if we could have some music as we silently reflect. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus, to the sin-sick fallen world so that we can be saved. In these moments, Impress the wonder of the gospel, the wonder of grace in our hearts yet again. Motivate us to live lives that are pleasing to you. Motivate us to live with ever-increasing holiness, not in our own strength, but in the strength that you provide through gazing on the gospel. Drive the gospel deep into our hearts this morning, we pray. Amen.